servant leader, right? <laughs> Amen. All right, uh, we're going to be, oops, uh, we're going to be in Acts uh, today, continuing our series. Uh, but I'm going to start with uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Amen. So uh, this is a very uh, familiar uh, portion to us, this verse I just read, and I just wanted to start off what... I was going to cover from Acts with this verse as a reminder that God often gives a vision to prophets and faithful men of God of his plan way ahead of when uh, he will bring it to pass. So um, here Habakkuk is being told and said that be patient, don't worry, what I told you will happen. It will happen at the exact time that I intended it, but you have to wait. And in the end, it will will not lie, meaning God never lies. So when God said something, it will come to pass exactly the way he said it, right? So, but the, the path to get there oftentimes is very painful, and the path to get there so oftentimes is not uh, what we think it is or what we expect, but what he expects from us is faithfulness to the vision and obedience uh, to the call. Amen? The other thing, sometimes we mistake um, or conflate our uh, you know, fleshy desires with the visions of God. And uh, I don't say that God doesn't give us uh, visions and promises for the things we are hoping for in this world. Uh, But really, most of the time, God is expecting us to be faithful and seek His face for as He builds out the kingdom of God. Okay, so um, the reason I said that is because oftentimes this passage is misused to give people hope for things that may not be where God is. Uh, leading them to, right? We hope in things that maybe that's not what God told us, and then we lose our faith because it did not come to pass, right? And we hold on to things that maybe God never told us. So the thing to remember that is don't just rely on so-called prophets and things that sometimes we don't know if they're sure, but ask for God, ask God for a direct revelation to each one of us, right? So we believe that God has given us a vision. God is going to speak to us directly, right? While we have elders and pastors and leaders in the church who God has put in our lives to, uh, you know, lead us in the word, but God really loves to speak to each one of us personally. You all believe that? Amen. So God is not just standing here in this high place and, uh, you know, telling you things through an intermediary, right? Uh, 1 Timothy 2.5 says, there is only one uh, mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. The reason I said all this is, God is desiring to give each one of us a vision that he wants us to play a part in for the building of his kingdom, right? And for us to work towards that. The question is, are we willing to listen and to be faithful to that call, right? So with that introduction... I'm going to take you straight to Acts chapter 16. Um, Actually, I'm going to start with um, verse 16, uh, 22 through 25. Acts 16, 22 through 25. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, 
who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So, uh, so I wanted to start with this because this is just a snapshot in time of what Paul and Silas experienced um, following a vision that God had given Paul uh, a little while earlier than that. But if you just look at this time in his life, if you just, uh, if you are in the position of Paul and Silas, and if he just focused on this time in his life, he might have thought, what is happening to me? Did I hear God wrong? If I was going to be, if I knew that I was going to be the inner prison with my feet in shackles, would I have taken this journey that I embarked upon? Right? You all with me? Sometimes when God, or most times, when God leads us on the path to fulfill a vision that he has given us, we have to go through certain hardships to bear that fruit. It comes with a lot of cost to, in order to fulfill that vision. And Paul here was no different. And at the end of it, there was joy, but at the peak of or the right before, just like it says, uh, the joy the, uh, might be morning in the night, all through the night, sorrow through the night, but joy will come in the morning. They were in the throes of this sorrow in the middle of the prison, okay? And so, if we were in that position, we might have thought, what is happening? Did I hear God wrong? Should I have come on this journey? Maybe it was not worth it, and... Or sometimes even wish that it's good to just turn back. Right? Because it's easy to say things, nice things, when we're not in that position. But when we're in the middle of the prison, it's hard to understand what is happening to us. Right? Okay, so now let's go back to chapter uh, 16, uh, verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto him. So a little background. So Paul had just left Antioch. And this is where he had a dispute with Barnabas, uh, as Minu touched on last week. And, uh, you know, they split apart and he took Silas with him. And then he came to a place called Derby and Lystra and Iconium. And there, and there were disciples there. He was going back to the places that he came to with his first missionary journey. Okay? So he came back to visit those churches, confirm that they were on the right path to encourage the believers, he came back and he met somebody called Timothy, okay? And who he brought along with him, he was, uh, and they formed such a bond that later he wrote two bo uh, letters that became two books in the Bible, and he became a, almost, uh, like a son to Paul. We all know the story, right? The point I wanted to make about that is all these things that we've been talking about from the Acts, like I said before, we know the stories, right? We know what happened. But the point of learning this is to understand how a healthy church, a New Testament church, should function, right? So like Minu talked about uh, conflict resolution. We have the right structure in place. Then if there's a conflict, uh, it'll all work out, right? The, the people are obedient to the leaders in the church, and they figured out, how to resolve the conflict. Um, and now, the other aspect of a healthy church is forming disciples. As Paul was 
uh, me, uh, with Timothy and later formed such a bond with him, we showed an example and he had many such people like Titus and others, uh, Philemon, and others that were he considered his disciples that well, we have to ask ourselves, are we fulfilling this part of the New Testament church, right? Are we making disciples as we live out this faith, right? Do we have a Timothy in our lives? Or do we have a Paul in our lives that are we allowing to minister to us, right? So that's one question. So I'm going to keep moving. Maybe we'll come back another time to touch on that. But so then Paul, as he went through these places, here, God specifically through the Holy Spirit told him not to go to Asia and then again a place called Bithynia. And, and that is very interesting because sometimes when we set out to do something for God, we just kind of do what we want, right? We say we think this is the right thing to do and, and we just keep going. If you can put up that map, uh, if you have it, if not, that's fine. Uh, but so this kind of map shows where Paul, um, his second missionary journey. So he was kind of on the, uh, on the right side of the map and is familiar places, okay? He was going back to familiar places and the places that he wanted to go to in Asia and Bithynia are places that he had already gone or in that neighborhood. But God is saying, that's not where I want to send you. I want to send you to a new frontier, a new place that I have a vision. I have seen somebody there that I want you to reach. And that's why I'm stopping you from going to these places. So at that point is when Paul saw this vision. Okay? If Paul had gone to these places, he might not have pushed forward beyond where he had already gone into new places to plant churches there. Okay, so that's when Paul received this vision at night. Uh, there's a man from a place called Macedonia, and we all know the story. This, this is now modern-day Europe, right? So Paul, because he was obedient to this call, was able to plant a church in Europe and which spread, and now it is people from Europe that came to India and other places that we were able to come to the faith, right? So God worked out his plan, and he saw each one of us, right? And it started with Paul's obedience to God's vision, right? He did not seek his own way, but he understood where God was leading him, right? And so anyway, so he saw this vision of this man saying, come help us, from a place called Macedonia he hadn't been to yet. So he went to uh, this place in Philippi. And so he came, I'm just going to run through the story real quick. He came to Philippi and he met uh, uh, a group of women. And there's a person called Lydia who came to the faith with her whole family. And if I was Paul, I could have thought, wow, God really fulfilled his vision here. And this is why I came here, right? And she, and he might have made a mistake and said, things are going well. Sometimes when things are going well, we think that everything's done. But that was not where God wanted him to be, okay? It, so like I said in the beginning, the, the end of a vision is many times marked with suffering, Okay? So when things are going well, doesn't mean that it's not in God's plan, but that was not the end of where God was going to take him. So he took, so, and this person, Lydia, her whole family came to the faith. And then she constrained Paul and said, can you please stay with us? Thank God for hospitality, right? Thank God for faithful men and women of God who encourage and and, uh, and, uh, and uh, minister to the servants of God. So anyway, so as he was staying in this place, um, there's this, and he was going back and forth from a certain place, and this young lady uh, followed him and was saying wonderful things about Paul. Said, these are the men of God, listen to him. So the other trap we sometimes fall into is, when we hear good things about ourselves, you know, we're like, man, God is really honoring me. 
God is really favoring me right now. Things are going so well. But Paul, he had the discernment to know that was from an evil spirit. How many of you know when somebody is flattering you sometimes, it's not always from God? You all with me? Not every flattery is from God. So, but Paul had the vision to say, to rebuke that girl, that spirit, and it came out of that girl, and she was healed. You all with me? So, but this caused such a stir that the people who are using this girl to make a lot of money, like we have sometimes false prophets today making a lot of money, so you had to wonder, are they from an evil spirit or from the spirit of God, right? That's why we need discernment. So anyway, so the people who are using this girl to make a lot of money um, were very angry and caused up a stir and, and, call, uh, and put Paul and Silas, uh, uh, br- caught them and brought them to the magistrate, right? And there was a trial and then they put him in the prison, which is what we started with. So at this point, if I am Paul, I'd be wondering, what is happening? Did, did I hear God wrong? Did I misunderstand where God was leading? Or he could have been angry with God, right? But what, he, what did he do in the midst of that inner prison experience? What did he do? What did he choose to do? Anybody? He was singing praises to God. He did not let prison stop him from praising God. He did not... See, our praises, you know, I will bless the Lord at all times. The praise will continually be in my mouth. Amen? Psalm 34. So we are not meant to praise Him just in good times or when we come together. But his praise should always be in our mouth. Whether we are in the inner prison when things are going so bad, we think we've lost all hope. All, we think we've failed and reached a point that everything has been gone away and his physical freedom was taken away. He was in shackles. And he chose to praise God with all his strength. And all the prisoners heard them. All the prisoners heard them. And... and and there was much joy in their hearts. It was not like they sang, you know, uh, out of pressure or anything like that. But they sang with joy and gladness in the midst of their shackles. And because of that, and suddenly, there was a great earthquake. A massive earthquake. God heard their prayer. And I, I'm always amazed how the earthquake you know, didn't just smash the whole place down. When God sends an earthquake, sometimes He does exactly what He wants, right? He didn't destroy the prison, but the earthquake just flung open the doors. Wow, did the earthquake have keys to open, unlock the doors and just swing it open? But when God does something, He knows what He's doing, right? So because He saw a jailer that He want that man in the vision was the jailer. So sometimes our oppressors are the ones that God wants us to save. You all with me? Sometimes the people who oppress us, that's why Jesus said, pray for those who despitefully use you. Maybe people use you in the worst way possible. In the most despiteful ways, they took advantage of you. And Jesus said what? To pray for them. Because that might be the reason God put you there. It is the hardest thing to do. For anybody. You can only do that with the grace of God. But that's what was part of fulfilling the vision that God gave them. God loved that jailer and his family. And he saw them. And he allowed his servants to go through such great trials to be able to bring the gospel to their house. That jailer, even though he was their oppressor, when he saw this, he was afraid and he came, he was going to kill himself because he knew that they were to put him to death. Worship team, please come forward. Um, Put him to death. And he was afraid 
And Paul suddenly said, don't harm yourself. We're all here and we're all saved. Nobody's running away. How many of us sometimes when we pray to God, we ask for deliverance and we're just wanting an escape, right? We just want God to deliver us. I always hear this, asking God for deliverance. Why are we wanting deliverance? To just escape or for God's plan to be fulfilled? You all with me? He could have just ran out of there and said, wow, this is our chance. Let's get out of here. But he didn't do that. He stayed there even though the prison doors swung open. He knew that God wanted him to stay. Because if he had left, that jailer would not have been saved. That was a man, that was a fulfillment of the vision that God had given Paul. It was through a lot of suffering. But in the end, like we read in Habakkuk, it came to pass at the appointed time. So as we, uh, as we uh, are led to worship here, let us ponder, one, God, am, am I, do I have a vision for where, what do you want me to do with my life? Am I seeking you to understand your vision for me? Am I faithful to the call? Am I persevering until that vision is fulfilled? Which is the jailer that you want me to save? Who is the oppressor that you want me to minister to? Who should I show your love to in my life? Fulfill your vision and your plan for me so your kingdom may be expanded. May his name be glorified.